the Business Simplicity Podcast, where leaders share their most successful strategies and the failures that inspired them, so business owners and managers can avoid the suffering and reap the benefits. With your host, your host Chris Parker. Hello, this is Chris Parker, and this is the Business Simplicity Podcast, and I am having a conversation with Marco Visser. And Marco and I met, I don't know how long ago, maybe 15 years ago, in the basement of a hotel smoking cigars, if I remember that. At least that's the earliest memory I have. We were at a CIO day, so, so the top sort of industry event in the Netherlands for CIOs and people working with CIOs. And we've been actually very good friends ever since. We have also worked together. So uh, once upon a time, we had a company together, pretty good knowledge, where we were working with some incredible thinkers, ex-NSA people, uh, hackers, engineers, uh, with the ambition of, how would we say that, um, doing massive data analytics in a way which respects privacy, which is a fantastic journey of discovery we're on. Maybe we'll touch on that. Um, Marco. Hi, Welcome. Chris. Can you share, just kick us off with, and I'm really curious how you describe this, um, describe yourself in, in the most simple way possible. What is it that you do? Uh, besides from being a dad and trying to get the most out of that, uh, I try to help teams get the most out of their potential and out of their people. And the thing I do that is, how I do it is, balancing the passion and your career goals. So how can you turn passion into profits, which is the business type of, uh, of work in it, but basically how, how can you get most of your people? How find out what they make, makes them tick and see how, can, how they can be successful. And I know in you for many years, uh, you, you live and breathe that. Um, why? Like I'm, let's dive into it more about you and, and I'm just, uh, you know, I've known you for years, and I don't think we've really had this conversation so directly. Why is this so important to you? Like, wh- why have you sort of dedicated your professional life to to getting the most out of people? Well, it's uh, it would be easy to say oh, I have a passion for people, but I think it is. If I think it started way back, uh, I was at Brunel. I just became a manager. And one of those guys was really great. And, but for some strange reason, I couldn't, couldn't get him turned on. And, and I, was, uh, I had a few clients, so I was, uh, sales-wise, I was successful. And he was struggling. Uh, and I just sat down with him. And I gave him one of my clients and was like, let's work this together and see how it works. And it turned him into seeing how fun it was to be successful. Just so I try to get him into a flow. And when he reached that flow, he was off to the races. And then I realized I had more fun watching other people be successful than me scoring the extra deal or scoring the more, the, another deal. So I found it more interesting and more, way more fun uh, seeing other people successful. And I think that comes back to my core, basically, is uh, I'm a pleaser. I want people to be happy. Uh, I, I, I'm more happy seeing other people happy than, and it's a pitfall as well. It could be a pitfall, uh, but in my professional career, it helped me a lot because if you take away your own ego and help other people find the sweet spot of actually having fun in what they do, and we talked about that at Pretty Good Knowledge a lot, like if you have fun doing what you do, then success is way, way a lot easier. I'm triggered by if you have fun with what you do. I, I tend to have fun with what I do. Um, and I also see in, in, in the world at large, there's a lot of people who just show up to work and suffer. So I'm, I'm curious, um, how do you do that? Like, like, how can you create the space for people to truly have fun at work? Because that, that you know, basically signed me up. So wh- what's, the, what's, the, what's, the, what's the trick? Is there a trick? I, I mean, don't know. I start, it, it starts with hiring. Uh, for instance, I, uh, 
most of the time I was involved with salespeople. And if you don't have that uh, passion or that spark in your eye when you close the deal, then you should wonder if you really should start doing it. Uh, but if you start doing it, then you need tools to become successful. But that first spark, that's something no manager can, can ignite. If you don't have that true feeling for I'm going to have fun and I'm going to uh, be really happy if, if, if my client puts a signature down on the paper, if you don't have the rush from getting that, then you shouldn't get into the business and you should do something else that makes you tick. So it starts with doing something that you love to do and finding that thing to do. Uh, Alan Watts has a, has a, a one of my inspirations is, uh, if you don't like what you're doing, you're going to end up doing uh, your whole career doing nothing. And if money was no object, what would you do? So if you were not triggered by careers, not triggered by I have to achieve something, otherwise it would not look good on my Facebook, uh, then you become that slave that you uh, talked about. So if you start one, and I did guest lectures at universities, if you if money was no object, what would you do? and find that thing and become good at it. And eventually you will make money with that. And it's almost philosophical, philosophical, but it has a good lesson in it. Well, it's, it's funny you talk about sales and, and, and that spark when you're signing, because um, I'm not sure you know about this, but my first professional job out of university, I graduated with a degree in accounting and then I went into sales. Um, because I never really wanted to be an accountant, but it was a good basis degree, selling telecommunications services in, in Southern California. Um, and I was not triggered by the signature. That, that just isn't what, what tickled me. I, I, I made my numbers and I got you know the free barbecues and stuff like that. And so I, I enjoyed that. But for me, it was the, what I discovered in myself, it was the solving of the problem um, which triggered me much more than the actual signature. And what I did notice is the, the, the real top salespeople were completely passionate and excited about the signature part, you know, that, you know, get hitting the numbers. And so after that, I, 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 I changed and I went into software implementation, which was more the solving of the problem rather than the selling of the, of the, of the solution. So, um, so if it starts with hiring, um, I have to ask, how, how can you hire a passionate salesperson? How do, what, what do you see there? How, how, do, how do you know that? I asked um, simple questions and weird questions, which are not basic for a job interview is, but when was the last time you were excited, really excited for something? And then they'll start talking about anything. And that's, that's when you see a spark in somebody's eyes. Uh, but also ask the question, uh, um, when, what's the, the biggest blunder you made and why? And what did you learn from it? And you, you can even go as far and you got to be careful with that nowadays. But uh, when did you last cry and why? And then you get, and it's not only for that spark, because that spark is what are you most proud of? But you get to know the person and you get to know what's deeper than the whole, uh, I have to sell myself. And sometimes I just stop an interview. If people are not, if I don't see the spark, I will just stop the interviews. Like I'm going to get a cup of coffee because this is something I miss in your whole talk we had for a half an hour. And it could go either way. It could go, uh, I, I see the spark or uh, we need to help you find something else. And then I come back five minutes in a later in the room and, and then either they regrouped or they really like, Meh, maybe you're right. Or they're crying. <laughs> you I haven't had that yet. Yeah. I haven't had that yet. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it seems like a very subjective thing of, of, of feeling that spark. And it, it also seems a very human thing that requires some, some investment in time and care. Um, I, I was just having a, a conversation earlier this morning, you know, sort of describing about how businesses both the, the the human dimension and, and what we call the hard business aspect. So there's the the human journey as well as the results, as well as the work, um, and and it, and it's both of those things. So once you have someone in the organization that has the spark, um, um, how do you? I don't know. What do you do with that? I Meaning, do you, do you elevate? 
or magnify the spark or what if the spark gets lost? Like how, how do you, how do you manage this? Or is this something that is completely up to them? No, you really have to help them. And I think the biggest challenge is if somebody's really passionate, for instance, what you said, the guys who really want the numbers, we really want the numbers. Um, you have to find a sweet spot between being passionate and not looking if, if that's the right word, but zealous almost like extremely passionate because if they become extremely passionate for even for instance for a signature they will start selling because of the selling and then people like you who have to solve it like will uh, impossible so that's the, that's a balance but mostly i think is how do you curb passion what i have seen in the last 20 23 years that i was in sales and, and in operations People who get overpassionate, eventually, if you keep on uh, magnifying that, magnifying that, you will put a pressure on them that they want to, first of all, they want to become, uh, they want to have your job, which is nice. And that's basically what you need to coach them to become if they want that, if they truly want that. But I think the, as soon as you get into the overpassionate, then it becomes dangerous because everybody will, one point in their life, uh, reach that disbalance of life and work and career. And, and, and that's what you see nowadays. And you see it probably more often than in the old days um, is that because of that overachievement and over passion, you will burn out one day. Uh, and I compare that to a race car. If you, uh, if you race real hard, you need a pit stop. Every once in a while, you need a pit stop and refocus. And, and I always look that there's three cornerstones in your life that of the three, at least two have to be stable, which is job, house, relationship. And if one falls away, then you have the balance of the other two. And if you lose two of them, if, if you lose yourself in your job, you can lose your relation or you can get so uh, drawn into it that you will forget about the more other important things in life or more important things in life actually. So that's the whole balancing, but, and what you see in passionate people and more, if they're passionate for their job or for their career. And that's because if you become passionate for your career, then you forget one thing is that if you become really good at your job before taking the next step, that's where the most fun is. Uh, for instance, if you're in sales, not all the best sales are best managers. So become good at sales and have fun in doing it. And right before you hit that point where it becomes routine instead of I'm learning, then you have to see, okay, what's, what's my next step? But what happens a lot is I'm good, I'm successful, so what's my next step? And... and the next step is, well, you still have to learn things and be good at what you do. And it could be sales, it could be accounting, it could be anything. Enjoy having fun. Yeah, I, th I think that that jump from from uh, contributor to manager is is a difficult one as well because those are those are different skill sets, um, different relations with people. Um, and, and it can be, it can be a challenge. So what, what happens if, if you, if you brought someone in with the spark or you adopted someone maybe without a spark and, and, and they lose it, meaning, meaning their, their spark is dimming and fizzing out and you're just losing them, um, losing their engagement, losing their interest, losing their passion. Um, how would you work with that type of person? I think the first thing is why? Find out why. Why are you losing it? Is it because it becomes routine or is it because you don't have that drive for the thing you do? And then uh, try to find what they're missing because everybody is passionate about something uh, and find what, what changed, but also um, what would reignite that flame. And... Uh, for instance, you have a lot of people in sales, and I'm in IT sales, uh, who get who become more passionate in the 
basically what you had is I'd like to fix the problems. Uh, I'd like to be, become a product owner, or I'd like to get into the, the details of what I used to sell, but I want, uh, and then help them find the way in that. And the best thing that could happen is that they leave you and not because you want to lose them. And hopefully you can find within your company, you can find that, that sweet spot for them again, but don't be afraid to lose them because they will be an ambassador for you. Yeah. Uh, moving people to their next opportunity um, can be hard, but, but I also find that it's, it's very caring and respectful because if someone's in a role that they are, just generally disinterested in or dissatisfied with either in the content or the context, maybe, maybe they don't get along with the team or whatever. Um, it's not good for them. It's not good for their teammates. Um, so, so something should shift unless you can resolve it somehow. Um, I'm, I'm curious. Um, how do you strike the balance between owning someone's success versus having them own their success? I mean, because it, it, I think this could slide into sort of a paternalistic save everyone type of approach, but I know that's not you. So I'm wondering how do you balance the, how do you balance the, the care for them without taking responsibility for their, their future and success? I think the most important thing is never be responsible for for their careers. Cause that's, that's what you said. You take ownership of their careers and they have to be, they have to do it themselves. And the only thing you can help is it's not even guiding. It's just walking beside them and ask, ask, okay, is, you think this is right? What I did, and I did that in the whole operation. And when somebody asked, well, because uh, I director and look, uh, I need a, uh, I need clearance for this or I need clearance for that. The only question I would do, what would you do if it was your own company? And do that and I'll support you. So basically, it's supporting. I think if come come to think of it, for the word for it, supporting. So walking beside them and uh, try not to hold their hands as, uh, which as a parent is hard for me, because I want to protect them from everything, uh, and it does not help. Is that an answer for your question? Yeah, maybe it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't help. Yeah, certainly in the long term. Well, uh, reflecting again back to my my own my own journey earlier in my career, just becoming a manager, I, I, I said, okay, the reason I'm here is to, to make you successful. Um, and I realized that that was just completely flawed, meaning I could not own the success of another person. And so through some struggle um, and realizing that and like, oh, because people are, you know, aren't succeeding. And I had thought that was my job. I'm like, no, that's not my job. What I, what I looked at is, is to create the space and the environment for, for work to be joyful and meaningful. And then it's, the, you know, if I can create the space, meaning, meaning some, some, some vision, some direction, you know, okay, this is why we're here, you know, some, some boundaries, meaning if you paint within these lines, you're, you're okay, you're safe. This is, this is, you know, guardrails. And then all the supportive bits, you know, tooling, team process, you know, training um, and, and find a balance for that. Then, and it's and it's different for every organization and every group of people that 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 how to how to find that space, but once you find it, it starts to move. And people people either check in or check out. You know, sometimes they say no, this isn't for me, but more often than not, people go, oh wow, this wait, you mean I can stretch my wings and and go for it, like, rock on. Um, so yeah, I don't know what, what how how did you figure this stuff out? Meaning meaning. Um, <laughs> what was your biggest fuck up that 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 maybe sparked this with you, or or how did you figure out these things? I had so many. <laughs> okay, can you give us the top hundred? <laughs> no, I, I think the the reason I want to do it different or different is if you have a boss. I mean, a boss and do this and do that. And I worked for uh, bosses and I worked for managers. And when I worked for bosses, I was like, eh, sure thing. You get back to your ivory tower. Let me do my thing. Uh, and I will uh, ask uh, for forgiveness rather than ask for permission. And if you don't live by that, it's like, well, 
ask for forgiveness. And if you really, really doubt, you, you can ask. Uh, but if you have to pull responsibility out of people or to like take some responsibility, if you have to do that. And in the past, I was, I, I was, I was pretty good in sales. So when I became a manager, like you do this and you do that and you do this and do that, then you'll be successful. And they did that and they were not successful. And they looked at me, dude, mm. it doesn't work. Like maybe because I'm really outgoing and open. So I, I never meet a stranger. But if you're more of an introvert, then that doesn't work for you. And so you have to find your own style. And, and as a manager, you can, uh, you have to give the space to find that and maybe mm -hmm. give one or two well, pointers, but like, well, I, what I did was this, but that worked for me might not work for you, but find your own style, find your own work. And it does not only include sales. It also includes for uh, accounting. Uh, if you control, you have to do this and then you have to do that. And, and, and of course the basics uh, are the same, but if you have great ideas on making the reporting better or easier, or then go for it. And if you mess up, then uh, never judge, but help them uh, not make the same mistake again. Yeah. And, and the best learning curve is making mistakes. Mm. And this applies for any business except for hospitals, because they don't want to make mistakes. But if you're a heart surgeon, then you have to have to follow protocol and do that. But basically anything else is the worst thing that can happen is you lose money. Well, I, I, I have to violently disagree with you on that hospital comment. Um, and, and, and I think it came from the, the Syed book, Black Box Thinking, that, that I think um, that one of the issues with they compared and contrasted airline travel with hospitals and the fact that, that basically airline travel flight is almost completely safe. It's because they, were, they had a learning culture around their mistakes um, that when, it, when, a, when an air, airplane landed into the side of a mountain and killed everyone, well, then that was taken extremely seriously and, 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 they, and they, they put in the protocols and all that kind of stuff. And apparently in, in, in hospital land, um, the hierarchy of, of lead doctor and the nurse and then, you know, the, that culture can sometimes, um, because they're making mistakes every, all the time, they're human, but they don't have the culture and the space to actually learn from that. And it's, it's um, so of course, if it's something completely routine and it's, and it's, it's it, it, you know, it needs to, 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 to happen based on, on a protocol, fine. But so often it doesn't, and then and then mistakes happen. So I, th I think there's a there's a there's a again, and I wish I knew that the magic bullet for this. That how do you create that that safe space for people to, um, within boundaries, make a mistake and learn from it, and then grow and become enriched and 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 become the better person for it. I don't know how how, how do you how do you how do you create that space. The, the example you gave for the for, for hospitals and learning curve and everything uh, reminded me of a discussion we had with Aryan, our partner in, uh, in PGK, that protocols are maybe not a bad thing there, but the hierarchy is that if you were in an operating room, that's the, one of the examples that Aryan gave, was even the intern in an operating room should tell, could, should be able to tell the surgeons, like, well, you made a mistake there. So it's not the protocols or the things that you do right, but the hierarchy that prevents us from that learning curve. Yeah. And that's the safe environment that you need to look for. Now, the, the, way, I, the way I describe it, let me see if I can describe it, um, coming in a little different tangent, is, is the type of organization that I would like to work in is, is, again, as a manager or an executive, is the type of organization where I, I really am able to serve the, the team while, and it might be the wrong word, but protect the, 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 the chain of command. So basically, if I'm typically reporting straight to CEO, my mission is never surprise that CEO and, and basically deliver. So in that, and in that way, protect, but then really focusing on serving the team. 
organizations where I find it very toxic for me is where and I have to do the 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 opposite. Basically, I, I'm forced to serve the CEO, and in doing so, I have to protect the team because for yeah. me, it's just the, the my day is upside down. Um, and that, and for me, the whole serving of the team is exactly that of, okay, well, this is roughly, you know, giving them context, the context and where, and where they can work. And, and, and so they can get the content done because, well, you know, me, I, I manage the technologists a lot, but I am not a technologist. So, so please never let me touch a keyboard, um, you know, because that would be, that would, they'll end in pain and suffering. Um, um, is this, is this something that is, um, well, I, it has to be situational, but but one of the things that's, that that comes up a lot is millennials. So, like like, have you discovered that that this channeling passion is different when you're, let me say, managing older codgers like me versus some fresh out of school uh, millennial, or or is it all pretty universal? What's your what's your thought? Trying to go out on a limb here, but I think. Looking back at all the generations, culture difference, yes. Uh, you used to work for 50 years at Shell, and then you go get your golden watch, and then you retire. Uh, and and the new people, because of the world is so small, they just look for projects and cool things to do. Um, social media helps a lot, because eh? you, you have to be a manager, and otherwise, at least at 25, otherwise you will not count. But basically, people are the same. Uh, our older generations, and I wouldn't consider me the older generation besides the gray hair, it's basically we're the same humans with different tools. But the core brain activity is basically the same. Uh, we just have different tools. And the world is a little bit smaller than, than it used to 40, 50 years ago. But passion is of all ages. And, and, and channeling that and... The pursuit of happiness, which is like ooh, really uh, fluffy, uh, but that's what drives us people. I had weird conversations with friends of mine who I have one friend, great, great, greatest guy, and his happiness comes from putting in the least amount of hours for the most salary, which is in my brain is completely because you don't work hours, you get a job done, but he, he is in a, in a, a processing, uh, he works for a processing company. So that's his thing. He, if I work on Saturday, then I have to, don't have to work on my, and all that, but he's happy with it. He's greatly fond of his job. He loves doing what he does. And that's one that makes a stick. And you like to make things simple and you have the, your superpower is, really complex situations and you draw three circles and a, and a few uh, lines and then the whole process is basically this is what it, and I've seen him doing it and it's amazing. And, and I like to see a smile on people's faces that they have achieved uh, their goal. So that's everybody yeah. and, and, and it's different generations, different ages, but basically it's the same thing. Yeah. The, the, I, I there's some buzzwords floating around um, around mastery and autonomy. And I, I, I tend to agree. Those are universal. Meaning people like to improve stuff. They like to learn things and they like to, to develop, you know, and they also like to, to do that in, in a way which they're sort of the master of their own destiny. And um, I think this channeling passion for profits is, is yeah. Tapping into that humanness. I think what it, I think what it, what it, if my superpower, which you described as, is, is simplifying, um, I, uh, what do you think your superpower is? It's kind of hard to, uh, to look with my superpower, but I think I have an eye for, for talent, which is, also fluffy, but I think I, I like people. I love people. I love meeting new people, uh, and that's on a personal level. And but I bring that so that if I talk to people, I'm generally interested in people, and that helps me create uh, motivated teams. Because uh, yeah, 
I was about to, I was about to tell you what I thought your superpower was, but then yeah, I go ahead to do a question. Well, what came up was care, and then and I, I, I would and then in my mind I, I I adapted it to this really authentic interest in care. Um, in the context of you know of business, meaning meaning you always hit your I don't know if you always do, but it, it, my perception is you're you're hitting your numbers regularly and growing and and you know financial metric success, but you're doing it in a way that has uh, truly authentic interest and care for the people, and it, and it's and and it's through that superpower is, is why you why you you hit your numbers and grow your business so well. So um, nice. I'm 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 curious if people you know people have been listening because there's been a lot of I, I think it has to start with let me look back that spark of a salesperson needs to be inherent if I understood that from you the spark for for the the sale i'm my feeling is and this is probably me my last question um that a great manager that has authentic interest in caring people has to have that spark inherent with him as well care for people or do you think that's something you can train and grow or is this going to be something that that needs to be there and you can refine it with some of these techniques and strategies that, that you've shared i think it's one of the biggest problems that we have in in corporate world is managers who don't have that if your manager and and like you said protecting your people but given the, the environment to grow i think at least 70 the 80 percent of managers are looking forward to looking up to okay what's my next job and uh, who do i uh, uh, have to surpass instead of looking back and actually doing the thing you're supposed to do and is creating the environment to help teams grow. And you mentioned sales, but it, it goes for everything. The passion goes for everything. If you're uh, an office manager, you should have that feeling or receptionist. You should have that people. If people come in, you need to have that spark that you welcome people uh, office manager. You would like to have everything in order and Everything has different passions and sparks, uh, but for every job, there is something that you need to have fun at it hmm. or to become good at it. Right. And I think, and I think, yeah, I think that the biggest problem is managers looking forward, busy with their own careers instead of actually trying to create an environment where people uh, will be good and make yourself obsolete so they become there they become they can get your position and that's basically the whole basic of being a manager is helping people surpass you uh, well I, I, you're preaching to the choir here i'm just wondering i, I can imagine some people might be thinking oh that's uh, I, I don't know curious what, what people think um I, I, maybe it's a different paradigm of 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 scarcity scarcity and abundance thinking so if, if you live in a, in, a, in, a, in the mindset of scarcity and, and you need to take power and control and, and to, to serve yourself and your ego and your career as opposed to a, a, you know maybe abundance thinking where, where hey you know what if i help other people succeed i know inherently that i will also succeed and i think this is uh maybe maybe part of that again coming back to authentic care and interest in people so um marco visser thank you so much um, Thank you. I, I'm really looking forward to this because actually you, you you sort of personify the very human and in, and in sales and an aggressive sales environment. And, and you said it can work in any environment, but a very human approach to management that is not only helping you succeed, but but certainly helping other people that you work with succeed. And I've worked for you in the past, so I appreciate it. So thank you. Um, uh, if anyone would like to get in touch with Marco, he's on LinkedIn. We'll put the uh, the link there to, to his LinkedIn profile in, in the show notes. So it's Marco Visser on LinkedIn. Um, so you feel free to reach out to him and get inspired by his authentic interest in care. So Marco, any final reflections or comments on what we've spoken about? No, I think I'd, uh, I love the conversation, uh, but I always have great conversations with you. Um, maybe if you... To like make a uh, one sentence or two sentences of the whole conversation. What what it is about is basically 
if you look at people and find out, okay, what makes you happy? If you're 60, 75 years old and you look back at your life, what makes you happy? What was the greatest achievement you had? Could be career, could be kids, could be anything. Then find a path to that. And that will make you uh, uh, successful. Because if you're 75, like, well, uh, I, I, I chose this path, but I didn't like it. There's no second chance on that. There's no second chance. So right on. Marco Visser, thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you for listening. Download the Simplicity Toolkit from ebrilliant.com to discover the power of the Simplicity Scan and Sprint. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the podcast on your favorite player.